And this term, Greek money, is actually drawn from a book of my supervisor published by Cornell, Cornell University in 2013, in which they show a big uh, pig safe uh, showing how rich the Chinese are. And then that book uh, is titled Great War of Money. But I'm saying that because I'm talking about Hong Kong, I say that Hong Kong is an outpost in the Great War of Money. So China is now becoming so rich, uh, we got probably the world's largest uh, foreign reserve, uh, 4 free trillion down from 4 a dramatic job, obviously, due to economic downturns and uh, recession uh, in recent years, but still a lot of money. But I'm, what I'm going to say and address this is in connection with some of the issues raised by uh, the speaker and uh, the audience today, that uh, why Hong Kong is so important, as Nicole suggested, why, despite all the, what I call, let me move it. Oh, yeah, so space bar. So the first line is distorted optics. So these are what I call distorted optics. So uh, nothing wrong to be, to, get on, to be honest. And the thing is that uh, we got a lot of discussion. I, I remember one of the, one of the uh, 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 audience on the floor, uh, he asked, I think, Chen Chen or uh, uh, Mr. Zhang or Martin, where, why Hong Kong is important. So he cited the example that Hong Kong's GDP, a share of Chinese economy, peaked in 90. Wow, and then the decline, right? So the, figure, the correct figure, I have got a hyperlink here linking to the Hong Kong Economic Journal website, suggests that Hong Kong's GDP as China's shares of the economy peaked in 1993. That is four years before the handover in 27%. Now remember China in those days was so very underdeveloped, right? So there's no stock market, barely has any stock market, the bond market was non-existent. Uh, the, four, the stock, we were only few years after the Tiananmen incident. So China was almost nothing. We said that after the Tiananmen incident. So it was the best thing hobby in Hong Kong before the wet chip boom, before the X share listing. Then the figure dropped dramatically and consistently is a secular decline for sure, which changed 2.9% in 2013. So the figure is updated. So if you look at the decline, it's dramatic. It shrink hobby by nine to eight times to eight, uh, eight to nine times, right? So if you look at this static snapshot, it obviously tells you that Hong Kong is becoming insignificant. It could be gone. But as of my title of my presentation suggested, Hong Kong is an outpost in the Great War of Money. It's an outpost. Probably one of the most important outposts. No other cities can, can replace it. The second often side figure, uh, I guess Professor Ming Chen also explained that part of this presentation originated from an article we submitted to an Asian survey journal, right? So uh, it's not, I don't exactly follow the layout of that thing. I've added up something uh, from other parts of my research and my colleagues' research. So the other often side figure for my colleagues uh, studying securities market openings suggest that the market cap of Shanghai and Shenzhen stock exchanges combined is now more than double of Hong Kong stock exchanges. Now, that obviously uh, is an indicator always quoted to suggest that how well developed, how deep, financially deep, uh, the China stock market, domestic stock market is. Uh, if you look at the figure of Shanghai and Shenzhen combined, it costs 6 trillion US dollar versus 4 trillion is, uh, as of 2016. So what you can see, if you just look at this simple figure, 8.6 versus 4, it tells you that Hong Kong is going to be gone, right? Uh, there's no listing resources in Hong Kong, so Hong Kong, farewell to it. Um, the third always quoted reason that Hong Kong is on the kind, uh, part of the, what I call this total optics, is that the renminbi use has now truly gone beyond uh, Hong Kong. Uh, started since 2003, Hong Kong began the uh, renminbi businesses, right? The uh, offshore renminbi businesses. And now we got almost a dozen of uh, renminbi centers, the euro RMB centers for the world. In addition to Hong Kong, we got Macau, we got Taiwan, we got Singapore, we got London, Frankfurt, Japan, Seoul. So the list goes on, and there are always skepticists saying that Hong Kong is losing its relevance. China can bridge the round world without going through Hong Kong. Hong Kong is losing its middleman and intermediary role. But I say it's bullshit because it's not true. Hong Kong remains important. Okay. This, this is these are the foul language I use. Teacher and writer, not what quite foul language. Treat him as a two one nine delinquent. Okay. Uh, electric shock therapy, right? Yeah. Then the last point I think is more recent is that we see one bell one row and the Asian structure investment infra infrastructure investment bank being very mainland central initiative. Now, we all know that Hong Kong is part of China, but if you look at all these official documents and all these policy rhetoric, uh, Hong, Kong has, Hong Kong's role has yet been formalized. Uh, as of recent month, we still see Kerry Lam, the chief executive, still discussing the roles of Hong Kong in the policy address, right? The Hong Kong government is now still bidding to host the second uh, headquarter of the AIB. The AIB being the infant a little bit of information is that Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is the first 
uh, multilateral development financing institution China has ever created. So China has created some of these institutions before uh, uh, AIP, but mostly on security fund, the Shanghai Security uh, Corporate, the Shanghai Security Organization or security issue. But this one is really the one that many IPE scholars, international relations scholars suggest that it's the one that would pose it to challenge the Asian Development Bank dominated by Japan and the World Bank dominated by the US European order. So Hong Kong obviously want to pick part of it. But if you look at the share, just like all these other development banks, the shareholding of Hong Kong is less than 1%. So what they really suggested is that Hong Kong has it got a very rather minor role. And Hong Kong's role under the OBOL, despite all the policy directory of Hong Kong official, the former and current chief executive saying that we need to pay a role. But the Beijing hasn't seriously approved it. And we are still trying to, I think, as I will explain, we are still paying this market across the two levels. Is it enter, right? Now, my argument of this discussion, I try to think of it systematically instead of telling you, uh, telling, uh, presenting it in a, uh, in a very descriptive way. So what I'm arguing is that from a political scientist perspective or from an IPE person perspective, international economy person perspective, um, we always look at just the market power of the a country. So Hong Kong is a serious economy. Hong Kong uh, has or had once command quite a bit of market power. But my argument throughout, as you will see in the later parts of the slide, is that it's wrong just to look at the market powers of the, of the whole story. Um, in the literature, in the scholarly studies about international, about monetary or financial power, we got to sub-dimension power to inference and power, uh, power as inference, power as autonomy. In both instances, I argue that Hong Kong is helping China to project its power, uh, monetary, monetary power and financial power. But the all uh, focus I mentioned, um, uh, highlight by skeptics or uh, I, wish, I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't say pessimists or observers about Hong Kong's decline is that Hong Kong's financial decline uh, uh, in the Chinese financial system is that Hong Kong has got once got considerable market power but has declined and has waned it. So if you look at all these statistics here, Hong Kong exercised quite a little bit, quite a considerable market power in the 1990s. Uh, the total amount of FDI we channeled to the mainland uh, was close to a trillion US dollar. It was a lot of money actually. Roughly, if you look at the total pie of everything, 52% of total inbound FDI to China. So that account for, for all sources from US, Europe. So Hong Kong is a small city. Uh, I remember one of the speakers, I remember it might be Cheng Chia. Um, he suggests that Hong Kong actually come out a disproportionate uh, leverage of inference, right? To uh, China, right? So if you look at these cities with 7 million, we channel 52% of to all total inbound FDI to China. And on the other hand, well, it's two-way forward, right? FDI, uh, inbound FDI and outbound FDI. Hong Kong, the city is also the largest beneficiary outbound FDI from mainland, of course. Many of these uh, FDI money goes to the offshore subsidiaries of the mainland uh, firms, but still they go through Hong Kong, right? So it's a hub of it. Um, the other off-site uh, uh, dimension that Hong Kong is the bridge. Hong Kong uh, possesses a lot of market power is that the offshore financial community, by that I roughly refer to uh, the financial community of Hong Kong, both uh, the UK, the foreign, or the local Hong Kong based, uh, uh, the Hong Kong uh, uh, financial community, financial interest, we facility have been involved in the listing of hundreds, if not thousands of mainland firms from the early days, web chips, uh, Hong Chao Gu, right, and the H uh, share companies. Different kinds of share, but of course, the trend, general pattern since 1980s, uh, has been that we see an increasing uh, uh, percentage of firms, Chinese background firm listed in Hong Kong. Uh, that might be uh, uh, a reason we see we. Uh, that might be the reason that lead to so much skepticism that Hong Kong's local firm are on decline. But overall, these Chinese firms have added up and contributed to total market capitalization of Hong Kong stock market. Now that really tells you something. But uh, the third trend is probably more worrying. Is that uh, uh, is is somewhat worrying uh, as we now move into 2000s. Uh, 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 17 is that we, unlike what we have in early 2000s, we got uh, when we got a lot of mega SOE, mega state owned enterprises, most of them being the big four uh, uh, mainland banks, right? The uh, Bank of China, the uh, Industrial Commercial Banks, and all these banks listing uh, going public trillions of their access. While all these things have catalyzed and reinforced domestic corporate and banking reform through injecting uh, international capital investor bases. Uh, indeed, if you look at all these political literature and all these China studies literature, China. E uh, studies about China's economics and financial reform studies throughout the decade. Most, many of them, many of the scholars will argue that through Hong Kong, through bringing international investors to capital, we have actually catalyzed and reinforces the trend of domestic reform. Now, of course, the market power dimension has waned, obviously, because we no longer have that much mega-sized 
a super uh, jumbo size SOE going to Hong Kong is listed, and the Chinese government is also becoming more reserved to have Hong Kong playing that important role, right? Part of it, some argue, is due to the Occupy Central movement or recent uh, uh, recent uh, political uh, instability, if you like that term, uh, uh, in Hong Kong that generate or elicit much reservation in Hong Kong. But I would say that's not 100% the whole story. Because if you look at what monetary power, financial power, it's not just about market power. Uh, power influence of an economy could be about money. On the other hand, it could be about politics. I guess one of the easiest ways to understand to start with Hong Kong is that we are still the reservoir of financial tradecraft and regulatory expertise. Now, these are the things that the mainland system, the mainland Chinese system, have yet to be able to match with Hong Kong. Now, you might say that. China has got thousands of returnees to uh, Haiwei, right? All these overseas, well-educated, uh, quite many of them educated in Stanford or in the top Ivy League business school. But in terms of regulatory expertise, in terms of the legal tradition, the trainings of how to regulate the market, Hong Kong still, the financial professional, the financial community is still possesses and rival expertise to onshore product financial development and uh, uh, onshore fin financial development. Uh, uh, I think uh, Mr. Zhang mentioned that your think tank talks about the dispute settlement, uh, 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 Hong Kong being a dispute settlement uh, center, right? But I guess in addition to that, we also have got the expertise of regulatory best practices, how Hong Kong and uh, uh, Hong Kong could be a role model telling what the mainland Chinese system, what we can, uh, how, what the world has been doing, what the world expected. Corporate governance, for example, is another very important dimension. Financial product development is another dimension, especially when the Chinese government is now going to develop the derivative market, especially in the commodity funds of it. Hong Kong, we've got all these expertise to develop commodities. Uh, the final point is I've highlighted here is more recent, and that draws from my more recent, uh, well, not quite, well, all these things are quite recent. Uh, last year's research on what are the roles of East Asian power in pushing back the uh, Europe and US dominated uh, post-crisis financial regulatory reform. And indeed, if you look at the special niche of Hong Kong, it's very, so unique that you can never find other cities or economies can replace it. Hong Kong is probably the only cities, city economy with their separate seat in the financial stability broad. So FSB was created after the global financial crisis as part of the global concert mechanism to promote policy coordination among uh, uh, finance and developing economy. So if you look at the list of the membership states, China, Brazil, all these G20 states, and then you can see Hong Kong. Hong Kong as a city possess a separate seat. Now if you say that FSB is general, fine, but then if you look at more specialized things as what I have suggested here about regulation, based on committee on banking supervision, uh, based in Switzerland. Now that is a committee, if you look at the membership again, check out its website, Hong Kong has got a separate member seat. Again, quite unique. We don't see Macau, we don't see Taiwan, never. But we see Hong Kong. And obviously, as suggested in the first point here, Hong Kong's financial official have always been considered to be the role model. And I believe there's Law Wa Cha being the first Chinese resident, right? Taped it to serve as the vice chairperson of the China's uh, uh, Security Regulatory Commission under Zhu Rongji's administration. Of course, she was kicked out or forced out a few years afterward, right? But that uh, began the, the trend of having Hong Kong's ex official serving as an advisor or serving as a, 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 a think or as a, a whether as advisor or in some uh, official capacity uh, for the mainland uh, uh, regulatory body. And after the financial crisis, we see more of that thing. Uh, in the IOSCO, for example, the International Organization for Security Commission, for example, uh, we see quite a bit of discussion, participation of Hong Kong uh, security officials. Um, IOSCO was uh, not to be famous for having the Ashley Adder, the former SFC chairperson of Hong Kong, uh, pushing back the U.S. and European regulatory reform. Now that really served the Chinese interest because Chinese government never want to implement according to the time frame of the uh, U.S. and European of regular authority. So Hong Kong actually lead the pushback uh, as, the as a leader of the Asia Pacific Committee. We also see Hong Kong participating in CPMI, the Committee of Payment and uh, 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 yeah, I've got a full name. It's basically about hearing and uh, of derivative. Anyway, so uh, it's, I have seven slides, so it's not much. Um, the more important role of that, uh, the other important dimension I'd like to highlight is that Hong Kong is now learning smart to play the two-level game. By two-level game, I mean the local level in Hong Kong and the mainland level. So put it very simply, Hong Kong is now increasingly involved in a very subtle way in the policy makings of China's financial opening. Uh, Hong Kong has been, for example, defining and framing liberalizing initiative as a story appealing to central financial bureaucracy. 
uh, in the China study literature, in the Chinese political literature, in IP literature, we always assume that things must come from Beijing. Renminbi internationalization, for example, RMBI, for example, uh, has always been considered to be a idea created by Beijing. But my research, and I would say my colleagues' research, have shown that wrong. It's Joseph Yam, the founding uh, the founding chairperson of the Common Monetary Authority, proposing this initiative to Beijing in 2001. Other initiatives like QD, QD, Qualified Domestic Institutional Investing Scheme, uh, that uh, allowed the uh, uh, mainland Chinese firm to invest in Hong Kong uh, stock market and all these uh, mar capital market were proposed by Hong Kong Bank in 2001. So Hong Kong was actually the, uh, the incubator, to use the word somebody used before, incubator of ideas. And in addition to setting ideas, we also leveraged a connection with uh, onshore financial industry. We got good connection with Shenzhen security exchanges. Uh, the Big Bay area, we have probably the extension of it, but Hong Kong and Shenzhen got working relationship in financial area all the way back in 2004 and 5, started with securities uh, uh, collaboration. We also got good friends with PBOC, which essentially is very important to make sure that Hong Kong's RMB initiative took off. And most important is in any aspect of Chinese politics, give and take, concessionary politics. Uh, one very funny example, one very notable example is that we see Hong Kong uh, engaging in, uh, uh, in, de in a deal with Shanghai that allows Shanghai to participate in the renminbi trade settlement scheme. So Hong Kong actually allows Shanghai to, to have a separate wood of renminbi trade, trade settlement scheme in 2009 instead of maintaining the policy of Tony alone, such that Shanghai can divide the policy boy and get a broader basis of support. So what I want to suggest is that finally, Hong Kong has also become a co-producer of uh, China's financial project abroad. So uh, it, that's, that echoes my argument or the IPE argument that China, Hong Kong could be used by China as a bridgehead of uh, projecting its financial power, both as power as inference and power as autonomy. Of course, China wants more financial, uh, more influences abroad. But Hong Kong represents a very accessible and de facto safe wharf, as I put it here, through affording the opening onshore parties, whether it's PBOC, whether it's the Shanghai financial industry, to advance their agenda. And that would also assure the offshore dissidents, the onshore dissidents, those disagree with the pace of liberalization, to find some spaces that Hong Kong is a little bit separated from the mainland political economy. And as China is projecting uh, its global uh, financial power abroad, Hong Kong has been playing a very important uh, intermediate role. Uh, the example I've called here, drawn from my colleague's research, about the roles of Hong Kong in bridging London's RMB Centre. So Hong Kong, we got so many of the British Bank, HSBC, uh, Standard Charter. Uh, in 2012, Hong Kong's financial, financial industry, especially all these British bankers and financial interests, they actually helped the uh, PBOC to network with the London financiers to catalyze the birth of uh, the London uh, uh, RMB businesses in 2013. So my colleague call it local but transnational connection. Hong Kong being a local hub, but we have transnational connection that no other mainland cities could have. And indeed, we are also becoming a de facto outpost of recent years Beijing strategic economic financial initiatives such as uh, the Global Payment Network. Uh, one interesting example of that is the Union Pay we now know, right? Union Pay is first debuted in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is the first jurisdiction to start Union Pay. We all now know it rifles Visa and Master, right? So. A quick picture before I wrap up. If you look at the map here, uh, the chart here, you will see that this is Hong Kong, right? And you will see that Hong Kong is here. And Hong Kong is probably at a closer, uh, uh, in a global financial network, they knocked it, all these nine, they knocked the transaction flow uh, in terms of portfolio investment. You will see that Hong Kong is right here, China's far away here. And if you look at all the ties and all the links here, what you see is that Hong Kong is actually still quite very much connected to the west of the global financial hub, UK, US. Now that really tells you the political dimension. In terms of, if you look at the, the if you look at the absolute the kinds of Hong Kong in terms of market share of China's GDP, yes, Hong Kong is losing its percentage. But if you look at the network positioning, Hong Kong remains a very key node for all the global capital to go to China. Is here. So my final. And size is a little bit about implication. So Hong Kong's importance might have declined. Yes, that's true. But politically, Hong Kong's influence has strengthened. Its leverage expands beyond the city's market power, which is, uh, I think, the very important roles of being an IPE person. You, I tell the political story in addition to what economists offer us, right? And Hong Kong is also shaping, Hong Kong has been shaping policy parameters and uh, has been instrumental in the policy making process of Chinese globalizing financial footprint. But I guess the last message is also more important. We never see a financial power in history that flourish in a closed market context. Britain, UK succeed in a relatively open market context, a political context. They were a democracy at least certain stage. 
But China is not that. China is probably having the, the other direction, totalitarianism or, or ter of terrorism be like. So China definitely need Hong Kong as the open gateway to take, to connect itself to the global financial center. And indeed, the IPU research in recent years have all pointed to this very important domestic foundation of how a great financial power has come into being. Without certain open, competitive, liberal market context, we would never see a country assuming and becoming a great financial power. And if China chooses its political status quo now, being authoritarian or partly authoritarian, Hong Kong would be the gateway for China to achieve both parts of the best world, okay? So I'm going to be a little bit over answer to that. Thank you. I, in my years of experience uh, banking in China, uh, I certainly agree with Rick's point that um, there is still a very large gap between Hong Kong's capabilities and, and China's. Uh, in China, the finance center is still a very weak link. Now, um, and to follow up on uh, Vic's presentation, uh, we have um, comments from uh, <coughs> Professor Tang. Um, Professor Tang is the assistant professor at the School of Advanced Inter International Studies at Johns Hopkins, and uh, with, he obtained his PhD in uh, economics from MIT. Please. It's actually interesting why I'm here. Um, I uh, first met Professor Chen yesterday. Uh, and, uh, the, and the main reason why I'm in Bay Area is because I was looking for an apartment since I will be visiting Stanford next year. So uh, Professor Chen, who I talked to on the phone two months ago, said you should drop by and discuss a paper. And I didn't know I am going to be the only discussant uh, of, of, this, of this conference. Uh, because uh, the topic is so highly special, I don't know what Rick was talking yeah, about. And so you better decide for me. And, and I, my name is not on the program, and I never know when I'm going to talk and how much time I have. As a result, this is the first time that I will present with no PowerPoint. So I hope this is at least uh, interesting from your point of view, someone can actually speak with no PowerPoints. Yeah. Um, so let me, uh, so this is an academic conference, so let me say a few things about uh, the paper and then I will talk about the paper that I would write if I have uh, time and uh, the same amount of data and then uh, you know, let me say something uh, about my um, opinion about uh, economic policies in Hong Kong, uh, which I have not been very happy about. Uh, so the paper is an excellent paper by the way, you know, the 20 minute presentation didn't do justice. Uh, to, to the paper. Uh, uh, Vic has put a lot of effort to uh, do very detailed research and collect information about you know, what has happened uh, to uh, the financial integration uh, between Hong Kong and China in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm an economist who work on the real sector, meaning that I look at trade, economic growth, uh, inequality sometimes, so the financial industry is new to me. So I learned a great deal uh, about the financial sector in China as well as in Hong Kong. Uh, recently, I started writing uh, op-eds and short pieces for newspapers, uh, and I realized that if you want to talk about international trade, you will never get attention from, from the reporters. Uh, this is like a long-run phenomenon, and who cares about what will happen in five, ten years? We talk about finance, they are very excited. Right? You know, once I started writing about uh, our direct investment, you know, the financial markets, you know, the debt crisis in China and all this, I got a lot more phone calls from reporters and even invitations to go to panels. So a lot of times I just, uh, I mean, it's very easy to pretend to be a chi Chinese expert in Washington because there are not many uh, <laughs> Chinese experts. Uh, so, but this paper by Vic is going to be the foundation for all the talks that I'm going to give in Washington because it provides <laughs> all the institutional details for me to quote numbers and talk about all these reforms uh, that have happened uh, in Hong Kong. All right, so I highly recommend you to read it. Uh, so, you know, a couple of things, uh, since I only have six minutes, uh, is uh, the paper has so much stuff that I think you can split it up into three papers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> given the excitement about uh, One Belt, One Road, which most people have no idea what it is about, including myself, I think you may be able to sort of think about what is the role of Hong Kong, especially in, uh, 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 in financing you know, all these projects that uh, the Chinese government had in mind uh, that they wanted to implement. Uh, uh, in the one, one Belt, One Road initiative. Um, I don't think the Chinese government has enough money to implement whatever they said they are going to do. Uh, so Hong Kong is going to play, again, a very important role in financing some of these projects. The other thing which is very hot and important is the RMB internationalization, which is a section in your paper, but it deserves a whole paper by itself. 
again, you know, what has been the role of Hong Kong in helping that to happen, and what will be the future role of Hong Kong in making RMB as an international currency. All right, so those are my academic remarks. Uh, let me move on to uh, sort of a more general picture. Uh, this morning we had very exciting discussions about law, legal system, and uh, the democratic process in, in, in Hong Kong. But a lot of this, a lot of those ideas cannot be quantified, right? I'm an economist, I always think about data and uh, measurements. Uh, but there's a huge literature about law and finance, uh, which you must know, right? You know, written by people like, you know, uh, uh, Shaliver and, and Vishni and all the others. So you may go back to look at that literature and try to sell your paper as a uh, quantifiable approach to think about the legal process in Hong Kong and, and in China, right? So we have been talking about convergence. Obviously, there are two kinds of convergence, which is, uh, you know, China become more like Hong Kong, or the other convergence, which is, you know, Hong Kong people don't want to see, is Hong Kong becoming more like China. Uh, so you have data to think about this, right? You know, one idea that you propose in the paper is when firms chose to list it uh, on the Hong Kong stock market as H shares, mm. they had to adopt you know, all the high standards and transparencies uh, that Hong Kong firms had uh, to uh, uh, follow uh, in, in, in that case. Uh, so you know, in some sense, you could actually look at the corporate governance and how these firms become better once they become uh, uh, Hong Kong publicly listed firms. And in some sense, you know, those are the sort of grassroots triggers for uh, bigger financial reforms that we would like to see in China. Right, so that's my third academic point. So uh, I was born and grew up in Hong Kong, uh, and uh, you know one, one of the reasons why I'm here is because I'm thinking about going back to Hong Kong again after 20 years in the U.S. So something that I uh, wanted to say, which is beyond your paper, uh, is uh, the role of Hong Kong as a financial center is going to diminish because we have seen that, right? You know, remember Hong Kong in the 80s and 90s? Uh, it is like a middleman of international trade when the border of China is still closed for uh, trade. Uh, and that's the success uh, of Li and Feng, right? And if you talk to, if you talk to Victor Feng, you know, they are constantly, the company is constantly uh, uh, struggling about you know, what to do next, right? You know, they talk about like value chain management and all these business school ideas, but I think the profit margin is shrinking. So in the near future, we're gonna see shrinking profit margin for Hong Kong to be a financial market as well. So what we should do, right? So my last, minutes uh, uh, is sort of my wish list uh, for Hong Kong government or you know the economic policies uh, that Hong Kong officials should consider. Uh, being close to China is great, right, because you have all these opportunities and you know it's sort of the channel between the West and the East, but being close to China is also very bad, right? Look at Taiwan, you know, I also have done some research on Taiwan and people there, academics and also uh, ordinary people, they are constantly worried about losing jobs to China, uh, the decreasing productivity, and the lack of innovation. Right. So in some sense, this is sort of the Foxconn, Foxconn phenomenon. Uh, firms in Taiwan outsource all the stuff to China, including the high tech and R and D intensive part. So what is left in Taiwan? Nothing. Right. I mean, they are talking about tourism and street vendors and you know food trucks and all this stuff. Right. You know, I know someone was proposing that to be a potential solution to Hong Kong problem as well, <laughs> uh, which I, I think is crazy. Uh, uh, but you know, I, I think the honeymoon period of being the bridge between the West and China is over for Hong Kong to just free ride on these you know discrepancies. Uh, there should be a lot more active economic and industrial policies. And in some sense, I blame the Chicago boys, right? Those who sort of control academics and also policy making in economics in the 80s and 90s, right? They think your know, lazy fair champion by Milton Friedman is the way for Hong Kong to be successful. It may be true in the 80s and 90s when the time was easy, but right now, you know, Hong Kong is facing a lot of challenges, uh, and the rapid growth of China, there got to be more active uh, uh, policies to promote more innovation, more technology, uh, 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 investment, and uh, research. Uh, you know, a few weeks ago, there was a famous uh, economist who said, you know, you can purchase some special services in China using, uh, uh, you know, basically a cell phone. Uh, and and you know, I agree the autobus system in Hong Kong, for example, was totally outdated, right? I mean, it's unbelievably useless in some sense. You can only use it to take the MTR or buy something from the convenience store, right? So why Hong Kong is so behind? In the financial sector, I think there got to be you know, more innovations uh, on the technology front uh, in the financial market, 
uh, and also uh, not everyone can be uh, a, a person in the financial sector, right? You know, I mean, the Hong Kong government should stop thinking about like putting all the eggs in one single basket. You know, think about you know high education in a broader sense. Think about more use of computers. You know, it already lost all the opportunities by giving away the IT sector to Shenzhen in the, in the last ten years. So let me stop here. I think I used too much time. We don't have enough of our final program from January who will be visiting fellow at the Center for Economic Development across the street. That's why I don't want him to sit more than seven minutes because he will have seven months with us next year. And of course, 30 years from now, 2047, he may be Hong Kong Financial Secretary or even a Nobel Laureate. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Vic and uh, Professor Tang. Um, we will move on quickly to our uh, uh, next speaker, uh, Mr. Lawrence Ho. Lawrence received his uh, PhD in sociology from Hong Kong University, uh, but he also specialized in politics and uh, in addition to sociology. And Lawrence is going to talk about a very, very interesting topic, which is policing in Hong Kong. Uh, a topic which in recent days uh, have become a very, very, uh, it's a very hot topic, it's very controversial. There are several cases pending in Hong Kong courts on po police brutality, uh, police abuses, especially during the uh, uh, umbrella movement. So um, without much ado, I'll let uh, Professor Ho proceed. Okay, um, thanks for Ms. Chen for arranging me to make a presentation here. And uh, I, I study history in my undergraduate and uh, public administration in my MPhil. And uh, I never imagined that I can present something about the police because I show no interest to the police at all, except for watching those films produced by GVB and those uh, film producers. I know all the police information from, from that kind of you know, production until I had a chance to study criminology for my PhD. And later I find that this, this unit is a little bit unique. And uh, it drew my curiosity, and later I spent about 10 years on studying about the policing. And of course, at the beginning, all the people discouraged me from doing so until 2014. All the situation reversed. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, this is my background. I, I, I just mentioned that uh, uh, I spent quite a lot of years in the policing studies. And uh, let me declare uh, firstly, and uh, I am not part of the police. Although I have frequent interaction with them, and I think uh, to a certain extent, they, forced, they were misunderstood by the public. But at the same time, a lot of the public thought that they actually were betrayed by the police, you know, particularly in some of the confrontational policing scenarios. Uh, these are my publications in recent years. And today, I think uh, I would like to focus on three aspects in my presentation. I just had 20 minutes, and I'm quite poor in time management. I, I hope uh, you would remind me you know, in, in the coming minutes. And I think the first, first dimension I would like to cover is uh, I, I try to study policing and try to explain what has happened in, in the past 20 years of Hong Kong in the aspect of policing from historical angle and institutional angle. Uh, I, I do not research uh, by browsing their so-called secret document or whatever, but just based on those openly accessed material, I think to a certain extent, it can explain how come this kind of misunderstanding or communication problem in between the public and the police uh, happening you know, in the past 20 years, particularly in the past, past five years. <coughs> Second, how about the controversies? Because uh, since 2014, I got a lot of inquiry from the media and from the, pe from the people who feel interested in policing, and they keep on asking me some kind of very basic questions. What has happened in Hong Kong? Uh, it seems that police was very violent. It seems that uh, they used the tear smoke very, very bad. And how could you understand who ordered you know, the police to stop this kind of so illegal activities? But of course, uh, I think it can be understood to a certain extent from the institutional as well as the historical angle in this aspect as well. Thirdly, I would like to raise several questions that may be related to policing about the development of Hong Kong police and policing in the coming decades. Um, honestly, first of all, I think I need to make another declaration. That is, in, if you browse the document from the police, 
about protest management, you can find nothing. Because in the police definition, there is no protest management. There is just called public order events management. They use quite a, a, a neutralized term to describe what has happened in the street about the confrontation, about the protest, and of course, of course, in all the documents they release to the public, they would use this term. I think uh, there are a lot of experts here, legal experts here, that you know that. They call it public processions. Of course, itself is a kind of very neutralized description. Okay? And of course, from the social activist perspective, this is totally, totally, totally wrong. You know, this is actually social movement. This is protest. And at the same time, you also fail to find a single center, single face in all the police documents. This, this center is called umbrella movement. You know, we talk a lot about the umbrella movement, but if you browse all the documents from police carefully, there is no umbrella movement because police never admitted publicly this is a kind of movement and this is a kind of illegal occupying activity. You know, you know in their position, it means something, and of course, they have to take some kind of stance to, to manage all the protests you know, happening in Hong Kong in these years. Okay, I think uh, most of the audience know Hong Kong quite well in these years, but I think these are all the landmark events about protests in Hong Kong in the past, past uh, two decades. Uh, a lot of people wonder that 1997 is one of the landmarks, but um, from my research point of view, I think this is not, because in 1997, the scale of the protest is, was relatively, relatively small. Alternatively, 2003 was a landmark. 2005 was another landmark because it was the first in, in encounters towards the translational protesters in Hong Kong, because of the Korean, those Indonesian came to Hong Kong, and from the social activist perspective, from the policeman perspective, it was very, very landmarking and legendary because these encounters teach them a lot. For the, for the social activists, they learn a lot of new innovative, innovative tactics to deal with the police. The police also learn a lot to deal with the new innovative tactics you know, overseas. 2006, 2007, 2007, 2010, these four can be categorized as the emergence of, first of all, young social activists because of the struggling between the social developmental strategy as well as uh, the way to protect Hong Kong's heritage. And at the same time, we also have another 2010 and 2014, of course. For the 2010 uh, anti-national moral education uh, protests, I, I, I would like to list, list this event here, just because, first of all, we noticed the mass participation of the youngsters. But at the same time, don't forget those parents who are also involved in this event because uh, they think that the education system is about to change and they show their worries for the potential development and they also showed up. Actually, these two, two groups of people, to a certain extent, were the strangers you know, in the protesting scenarios. And this is very important in the aspect of policing, and of course I will tell you more why afterwards. Is it actually a uh, typo? 2012, the Wang Jifong? Uh, 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 2000, 2000, uh, 2002, right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, not right. 2010. Right. And at the same time, uh, these are all the questions I keep on asked by a lot of the, a lot of the students and uh, overseas media. And, uh, and uh, these are all very fundamental questions, but I think to a certain extent, again, this can enable us to understand the development of policing group. And I would answer them one by one after providing my analysis. This question including how come it experienced a certain, certain decline of the police legitimacy? Because uh, in some years, particularly in 2005, we noticed that after the WTO encounters in Hong Kong, the police popularity reached about 80%. You know, I think it is totally unimaginable over the world. People support the police according to the public opinion poll released by Hong Kong, you 80 something percent. Second, police always mention that minimum level of violence. What is it? And in the technical point of view, in the literature point of view, if we browse those protest, police, uh, protest policing uh, literature, how do they describe it? What is it? Thirdly, the problem with this question, I think uh, it also happens to the state here, you know, we have a lot of arguments about how do they effectively and flexibly and reasonably use the discretion and of course if they do not use it uh, reasonably with reasonable justification it would cause a lot of problems afterwards. Hierarchy of command as well who order you know 
the escalation of the forces, and uh, how do you perceive the police and community relationship? How can we compare Hong Kong's development with the other states and countries? And lastly, is it a kind of so-called clash uh, in between the human rights and the police? And uh, I think, uh, as a researcher, I think uh, all of these kind of questions can be categorized into three major sets of keywords, uh, which is very, very simple. They are all very simple, and I would regularly teach my students in the, in the classroom. First of all, they doubt the professionalism of Hong Kong police. Interestingly, a lot of people appreciate the professionalism of Hong Kong police uh, right after the Hong Kong return to China. Hong Kong police was very professional, you know, in the projection of CCTV, you know, in the mainland media, Hong Kong police was excellent. It happened in 1997, but it seems that in this years, particularly after the um, um, 2003 and particularly after 2012, all the situation reversed. And these are all the possible reasons, you know, at least all of them are here. And actually, I just mentioned to all of you already. Second, we talk a lot about the neutrality because police keep on mentioning that they are very, very neutral. But how come? How come? Uh, Hong Kong citizens force them, they are no longer neutral. What, what, what's the problem arising? Lastly, the legitimacy problem. And I, I think a lot of people try to argue that, uh, are, are they serving us? Police claim that they are serving us, but some even describe that, are they commanding by Beijing right now directly? Uh, has it changed totally? These are all the three major categories of analysis. OK. Um, one by one, first of all, professionalism. Uh, I think I need to give you some kind of basic factual information before I answer the question about professionalism. I think Hong Kong, in terms of um, um, the ratio in between police and the citizen is really, really high because we got about 30,000 30, police plus civilian officers in the police force. I think uh, this cannot be comparable to most of the places in the world. That means we place quite a lot of resources in this aspect and uh, in fact, in terms of security feeling, you know, if you take a look to those uh, public, publicly accessible research results, Hong Kong people feel, feel quite satisfied with the, the sense of security in this aspect. Uh, they, feel, they, they feel quite safe. Okay. And uh, human resources quality, and uh, at least uh, our police got uh, bilingual abilities, and uh, most of them actually have got a degree or at least post secondary level. And uh, it, it is not bad totally, and when compared with a lot of Asian counterparts, and they were basically not very corrupted, or totally not corrupted, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they also need to pass through this so called wetting exercise in terms of they, they need to check about the integrity. Okay, basically, they will not get some kind of monetary personal problem, and, and they actually passed the test, you know, of the, of the government uh, for uh, having their reliability in discharging their duties. But of course, what is this is totally arguable, and we can talk a little bit more later. Police general order, in terms of institutionalization, I think uh, Hong Kong reached a very, very good level, because uh, they basically work according to order, and uh, the court case in Hong Kong actually provide them some kind of help and continuous adjustment of the general operation order. And make it <coughs> fine and fine, and, uh, but of course, uh, it depends on the scenario, but in the area of public decisions or public order management, I think one of the legendary cases should be the Lan Kui Fong in 1993. <coughs> I think, uh, uh, some of you have been there, and uh, it, it is a very famous place, Hilly Sloop, and uh, it happened a tragedy in 1993, and uh, at, at, uh, the then governor, Chris Patton, later decided to issue a special in inquiry uh, um, um, uh, panel, and eventually the court <coughs> provided a lot of order, a lot of, a lot of suggestion to formalize the public order management, and it shakes Hong Kong's terrain of public order management a, a lot. And uh, of course, we have judicial review case, cases, and it also shaped the public order management strategy after the sovereignty of succession. In Hong Kong police, actually, is very internationalized because up to this moment, we still have about 60 officers who are expatriate. Of course, they were all from Commonwealth. Uh, they were recruited uh, internationally, but based on Commonwealth origin, you know, before the 1997. And uh, 
Police also reform, but of course, all kind of reform were quite, quite passive, and they were driven by some kind of crisis. I think the last one should be 19, 1967, 1970s, and, uh, and after the Sino-British Joint Declaration, and we have the conclusion that we need to localize the police force, and it also fasten, speed up the professionalization stage of the Hong Kong police. And uh, I think uh, basically police also attached to this kind of negotiated management model in police management. And uh, I think this is a little bit literature, a little bit uh, academic. But in general, it emphasizes what violence means to deal with all the crisis, all the uh, public encounters. And that's why we have some kind of new initiative, very specified unit like negotiation, negotiation cadre, search unit. And is this actually show that Hong Kong police were quite professional in terms of public order management. Uh, but uh, of course, I'm not representing them to defend you know, all the accusations and uh, why they still get a lot of challenges. I think because several reasons. First of all, the image. I, I don't know how do you perceive Hong Kong police, but uh, to a certain extent, just like me, I know them. Before I work into the field, it's based on those uh, media coverage their proper image, and my first encounter with the police. And in fact, a lot of Hong Kong people know nothing about the police unless they have very close relatives or family dependent who are the, the, the police officers. They know the police because of the media uh, portrait, and at the same time, because of the first encounter, uh, particularly in these years, they have a lot, of, a lot of experience to deal with and to interact with the police, and it actually provides them some of the very if you do not like the word very subjective, at least uh, the, 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 the argument would be a little bit prejudiced. Second, uh, about the discretion. Uh, working according to rules should basically means good because uh, we stick to the rules, stick to the regulation. But the policing is something very interesting. I still remember there was a professor who we might, who repeatedly reminded me. Policing is a kind of dimension that every single, every individual in the society cannot avoid. No matter you like or dislike it, you have to deal with the policing from time to time. And, uh, but at the same time, if, we, if the police officer got too much discretion, it may be problematic. If they got no discretion at all, it is also very problematic. This is very, very paradoxical. And in the case of Hong Kong, when we arguing that police got too much discretion, but at the same time, from time to time, we may expect them to have more discretion. Like when you park your car illegally, you hope that police will give you discretion and then <laughs> would not easily detect it, you know, to you. And our police image would be positive, provided that there would be absence from the policies, politicized policing issues. No argument, no argument is based on the fact that there was no major clashes for the understanding of one country, two system, and also our so-called ideas towards the government. And at the same time, at the same time, we also show, we also find that police got limited transparency, you know. And uh, in the past, that's okay, but now we hope that, you know, they must be more accountable. And I think the situation actually changed, and uh, particularly we are more educated, and we, in the information era, we hope to know more about it. Okay. Second, neutrality. And uh, in, in, the, in the Hong Kong context, uh, we, 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 we would not call them very political neutral, but in fact, we are absent from party politics. And uh, I think, to a certain extent, Hong Kong police hasn't changed their nature, and they claim they serve the community, but at the same time, in the principle of smooth transition, they actually were still, they were still the agent of the government, you know, to a certain extent. That's why they are, uh, Establishment is still parliamentary. That means they can escalate their force to manage the protest easily. So that's why they have the PTU, you know, in, the, in, this, in this moment. And uh, our understanding towards the political neutrality is a kind of myth, not very, 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 very academic. No left, no right. Uh, and actually, it is shaped, continuously shaped by the geopolitics, you know. And uh, when I talk to my student, oh, not leaning towards Beijing, not leaning towards Taiwan means uh, 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 political news. But I think this is totally, totally misunderstanding, you know, in our understanding, uh, because academically, it is not justified. Okay, lastly, it's about legitimacy. And uh, I just mentioned about the so-called right of command, uh, what is the primary purpose of the Hong Kong police force. 
And I also mentioned that the source of legitimacy of the Hong Kong police actually is based on their performance and your, your understanding, your support based on their image created. But never forget that uh, they are still having the line of command, which is still a little bit colonial. And I think to a certain extent, we may remember, we have to remember this, this jargon, 50 years unchanged. You know, Hong Kong political system and Hong Kong policing system actually hasn't changed a lot, you know, uh, after 1997, and problem actually emerged right now. And these actually conclude what I just want to argue in my paper, I think. And when we talk about, we have different understanding towards the one country, two systems. In the aspect of policing, we also have the expectation gap. Okay, we have a, a lot of dilemma because now we do not have the idea of ambiguity like in the past because uh, what we understand policing is based on some kind of very, very, mama fufu, very ambiguous, ambiguous uh, concept. And we, we do not care until crisis emerge. And I also mentioned a lot about the nature of Hong Kong police and it is not related to police. It is related to our interpretation, imagination of the one country, two systems, two systems. And uh, these actually also create coverages not only among the generation, but if even within the generation. Uh, don't think that all the youngsters would dislike the police and all the elder generation would like the police. This is oversimplified and I can find a lot of youngsters who also worship and like the police very much. And uh, actually it happens to Hong Kong and it across all the community and uh, I may like to conclude that this is actually because of the expectation gap and also our different understanding and interpretation of the one country, two, two, two systems. And uh, I need to cut the other PowerPoint. But uh, anyway, this is my last word. And uh, I would like to raise the questions, who to serve? Okay, if you would like to know more about policing in Hong Kong, I think you better to ask these three questions, how to serve, who to serve, and what to serve. I think, uh, the answer of these three questions may provide some of the reflection, reflection about what is Hong Kong policing and why we have the arguments about Hong Kong policing in the past 20 years. And I welcome you if you have further questions and we can have further exchange in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think in my, my own personal experience, uh, I think among all the government institutions, the police is probably the one that has lost the most trust uh, within the public community. And I think a lot to do, a, a lot of it has to do uh, with the images as shown on the media, especially during the umbrella movement and, and other um, uh, protest uh, events. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Professor uh, Ellen Alp. Ellen is um, a, a very familiar face at Stanford. He was uh, the Knight Fellow during 2005 and 2006. Yes. That's when we got to know you well. Um, and Ellen came with a very, very impressive resume. Uh, he was at TVB for over 20 years, yes. uh, starting as a reporter <laughs> and then moving on to producer and executive producer, and with many, many uh, award uh, winning uh, documentary productions. And I, I believe, if I remember correctly, the, the program was Summer right? Yeah, uh, News Magazine. magazine. Yeah. Right. And uh, Ellen covered uh, many events in China and in Hong Kong. And among the awards that he had received, or his team has received, include the Peabody Award, the Human Rights Award, the Edward Murrow uh, Award. And he has recently written a few books. And yeah. published a books, yeah. and um, the one that I remember was the Umbrella Union. Yeah. And then the most recent one, which just published, is Twenty Shades of Freedom. Um, why twenty? Why twenty? I have to categorize my findings. It's actually uh, the Chinese version of my uh, PhD thesis. I see. Okay. Uh -huh. So. Uh, Alan received his uh, PhD last year. He went back to school and he's, uh, he got his degree from the Chinese University and he's now a consultant 
professional, professional consultant. consultant. Not exactly a professor. <laughs> <And> <laughs> yeah, <I'm> not. <laughs> More than a professor. He's, uh, he's a practitioner and a teacher at the Chinese University. And so uh, Alan's going to tell us a little bit more about another area that is very, very controversial in Hong Kong these days, which is the media. Um, like a lot of other countries, uh, the Hong Kong media is becoming increasingly polarized and uh, suffering from uh, all kinds of issues. So Alan will educate us on this topic. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this research, the idea of this research um, starts many years ago when I was working in TVB News and TVB uh, was the dominant TV station in Hong Kong as we all know. Um, I was working as an executive producer and I noticed something very interesting going on. Um, it is about some subtle, indirect, unspoken ways of controlling news content. Um, This is a quote from uh, one of my interviewees in the paper. Uh, in fact, many senior news workers uh, share the same views that there is something happening. It's subtle, it's everywhere, but it's hard to tell. And it's not exactly censorship or not even self-censorship. And what is it? Um, in the past, uh, when we talk about censorship, uh, we talk about some very brutal measures, controlling contents, but of course nowadays censors will never wear any badge. And in the past, um, we used the concept of self-censorship. In Hong Kong we always talk about this term, but uh, I try to argue that um, the concept of self-censorship is uh, not easy uh, to grasp, because uh, usually we understand self-censorship as a deliberate act of self-restraint or strategic, strategic response or non-response with objective of soliciting award or avoiding punishment and give rise to unprofessional news judgment. But in reality, uh, we often found that intention is always hard to prove. And also, objective uh, may not be evident. And also, the standard of news judgment is also elusive. And I'm trying to argue that uh, use a new term, a new concept of constitutive censorship or structural censorship is uh, borrowed from Bourdieu. Uh, he was saying that um, the authority don't have to control, don't have to control directly the content and they can govern expression by governing the access to expression or the form of expression. And by constitutive censorship or structural censorship, I, uh, um, I suggest we should look at the power dynamics inside the news organization or other institution instead of looking at the product. So uh, by constitutive, constitutive censorship, it is different from the self-censorship con self concept by four points. That is, I'm looking at the uh, access to expression and forms of expression and how is it controlled. And also, uh, we focus not on cases because when we talk about self-censorship, we always focus on one case or two cases. And, but now, I, I suggest we should look at the structural phenomenon and we look at outcomes. I don't want to question the objectives or intentions because it's always hard to prove. And also, um, it's not a yes, no question. When we talk about self-censorship, we always think like, uh, is this a self-censorship self case or not? But now I think we should uh, judge whether there is constitutive censorship by a better of degree, but not a yes or no question. Um, so the, uh, I, I do the research, um, I interview uh, 69 uh, news workers uh, from the broadcast media and I also did some content analysis. Uh, the period of research is around the uh, uh, Occupy movement. So uh, I have many uh, examples from the Occupy movement. Um, I think um, 
this is important because uh, um, it's a clash of values. Um, Hong Kong is unique that we have an authoritarian government uh, just outside the door or, or on the doorstep, if not authoritarian <coughs> government uh, within Hong Kong. However, we are, we are always a city cherishing freedom. And we are always a city that are very sensitive on any, uh, any censorship uh, measures. That's why um, the authority, if they want to exert any influences, it will be very subtle. And it is done through the organizational fabrics within the organization, a news organization. And I think um, Hong Kong is special, unique, and important in a negative way. In this sense, I'm talking about um, because we have so much crash of values and also the media become the hot spot of struggle and it's a battle of censorship and um, resistance of censorship and I, I suggest you can look at Hong Kong as a crystal ball of um, understanding how tacit control is manifested in a very sophisticated way. I think um, this concept may be useful to other countries or cities, not authoritarian, but uh, maybe some countries who have elected a president, an authoritarian president. Uh, maybe it is ap applicable uh, um, as an uh, example, it's applicable. Okay. Um, so I categorize the uh, foundings into 20, what I call enable constitutive censorship practices. And it's uh, all divided into three systems within the uh, power dynamics within the news organization. Um, I'm not going to uh, uh, explain every one of them, but I will pick some uh, important uh, and symbolic practices. The first group of these practices, this censorship practices, happens in the regulative system. Uh, for regulative system, we must uh, bear in mind that we always uh, neglect the power of the organization. Uh, this kind of power is inherent in the hands of the boss or the senior management. In fact, they can, they have the power to hire or fire. They can control the employment. Um, they can, uh, they have many ways to, man, uh, to manipulate the resource allocation and personal deployment. And some of the journalists said, uh, the boss has so many vehicles to take on you. They can freeze off salary, and humiliate you, and also, um, what is that is, they can uh, limit, uh, they can demoralize them by not raising their salaries. Um, this is uh, inherent power that, uh, that is in the hands of the boss. And these are the catchwords, the keywords that I always heard from the journalists. One of, the, one of it is the moonhood blood renewal, meaning that they were changing all the personnel is the uh, survival of the tamers. They were selecting those who are obedient and the outspoken ones, the ones who emphasize on investigative reporting, in-depth analysis, are sidelined. And the other way, the other term is uh, young gone. What I mean is uh, the gradual dwindling of resources. And um, there are a lot of uh, different censorship practices, but I will focus on how resources can affect the journalist's uh, content. For example, they will look for something, because they don't have enough manpower, they don't have enough resources, they will look for topics that are not risky. They will look, look for topics that are simple. 
and quick. That means it's not uh, in depth. And also, in other cases, because of the lack of resources, some editors said uh, they will use global times <laughs> commentaries. <laughs> global times is uh, uh, the nationalistic propaganda mouthpiece. Um, in the past, they can analyze themselves and use some other uh, sources. But now, because they are in lack of time and resources, and global times are actually quite good, they are quite comprehensive, so that they can use their analysis as their own and write it very quickly. And also, another uh, scenario was, um, they are hiring very young journalists. Um, this is a Beijing correspondent. Uh, she complained that the Beijing correspondent is getting younger and younger. In one occasion, uh, she told the Beijing correspondent to interview some dissidents in Beijing. But those young reporters said, I'm busy. And some said, I am scared. And some said, it's tough and no one will thank you. So um, the young reporters has a problem that uh, they don't want to risk and they know nothing about um, Beijing coverage. Some of the young some of those young reporters, they don't even know the office hour of the Chinese official. They call the Chinese official at noon, not knowing that they are lunchtime. And another thing is that um, many news outlets started to hire mainland journalists. Okay, no offense, they are good. They are very good. And their language ability is good, but they are detached. They have no sentiment, no personal affection to Hong Kong events, and that's why they are hired. Um, <laughs> another thing is about the uh, routine. It's about the cultural cognitive system, uh, which means the news routine in the newsroom. And these are the uh, catchwords, the keywords that I always heard among the journalists. They describe the newsroom as a sweatshop, and they themselves, garment worker. Why? Because they are like garment worker, working on one button and one small part of the clothes, and they don't know the macro they, they never write a script by themselves because nowadays what we call is extreme specialization in the news routines. In the past, we have three newscasts, but now because of the 24 hour news, they have 48 newscasts every day. So they have to uh, renew the content, they have to live report instant news here and now it means a lot of work, and that's some uh, a very uh, I think representative uh, soundbite from the journalist that you are never told not to do something, but you will never have time to do anything because they are so busy, and and at the same time they don't have enough resources. That's what they said: taking away our knife and give us a wooden stick while asking us to fight the war. And that's their feeling. Uh, and also, because of this uh, extreme specialization and division of labor, um, it results in a low level workers fragmentation. And also, the senior members, the, the management can call the shots because they know all the details, but not the journalists, the frontline journalists, because they are just garment worker working on a very small part of any story at all. Um, so um, another very important development, if you watch uh, the television news in Hong Kong now, you will find that the content types is changing a lot. Um, you will find a lot of soft items, uh, financial news that focus on um, market prices. They are not analyzing 
uh, Hong Kong China financial situation, but they focus on the market uh, prices. And there are a lot of new programs that focus on teaching you English <laughs> and teaching you where to buy property and teaching you interior design, teaching you uh, how to renovate your house and also some programs about traveling, about weather. So what's the importance, uh, what's the consequences is that um, this is, uh, I think, a remarkable uh, soundbite from a journalist. The management seldom mentions news, but more on information. The program I talk about are all produced by journalists, not other program department. They are produced by journalists. And this reporter said, I feel disturbed. For uh, ordinary audience, you may find it difficult to di distinguish the differences between news and information. But for us, information means something that is not critical, that is soft. Uh, you don't need much in-depth analysis. It focuses on practical use, and it means we will have less investigative report and in-depth analysis. And the problem is the news organizations are making more assembly lines on these soft topics. And they allocate manpower and resource to this new assembly line. That means with the same amount of manpower, they couldn't do serious reports. And these are those very tacit influences and tacit uh, uh, mechanism to control the content of news. And some journalists said that uh, we are not doing well. We are not doing what we should do. And some may ask, well, um, this kind of constraints happen anywhere in the world, right? But I think uh, I would like to use um, a metaphor of a going up a stream. Um, it's like uh, when we are going up the stream, uh, there are turbulences, there are currents. Um, we, as the sailor or the captain of the vessel, um, we have some. We can do something to it. To it, uh, for example, um, and as a captain of the vessel, um, you can go upstream, right? But it's difficult. I know it's difficult. But for some other uh, management, a manager, a news manager, they prefer flowing along the stream. They are reinforcing those routines. They didn't give enough resource for the practitioners to uh, go upstream. And the result is uh, they will be grounded somewhere uh, in the river and they can do nothing and will be driven by the currents and turbulences. Um, what I call is action of non-action. They can have choices. They can uh, invest resources to help the journalists to resist this, the current, but they don't do it. And what I call, I, I, I categorize, I, I, I label it as action of non-action. And I think I'm running out of time. And the last one is a normative system. This is a problem of using professional norms as an excuse. Uh, uh, for professional norms, um, this is, these are the words I always encounter. Um, the journalists always accuse the boss of false neutrality, pseudo-balancing, uh, and also moving goalposts. Uh, some journalists describe their boss as physically exhausted every day because every day they move goalposts. That means double standard in applying those norms. Um, I think we are running out of time. Uh, 
I, let me cite an example from the uh, Occupy movement. Um, this is one uh, anecdote told by a documentary producer. Just the day after police dispersed tear gas at the beginning of the uh, Occupy movement, a uh, document documentary producer said, Okay, at that night, I left the office. I was walking at the street corner, and I realized suddenly I don't have anything to do. What does it mean? They got no directive from the boss to, do a, to make a documentary or a long-form analysis on Occupy movement. After thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are on the street, they felt lonely. They ask themselves, am I a journalist? And it represents some, what I call, a coordinated absence. They are very reluctant to be the first to report to those politically sensitive issues. And um, what I call is an uh, um, action of defocusing, desensitizing, and this in this investigation, they avoid to set agenda. They avoid to investigate because they think it may be political uh, incorrect. Uh, I think I should end with this presentation. Altogether, there are twenty constitutive censorship practices. I think it is embedded in the uh, organizational fabric. Uh, you can find it in the power dynamics within the news organization. And um, I would like to end my presentation with no. this frog. Okay, uh, I think this is a very familiar story. Um, I, I remember Martin Lee always told this story. So when you put a frog into a hot pot, if the water is too hot, the frog will jump out. But if you put it in cold water and heat it gradually, uh, the frog will enjoy the warmth. And when, it find, when the frog finds it too dangerous, it's too late to escape. Um, I hope uh, my study uh, will serve as a reminder to people, to journalists, <laughs> and also to the Hong Kong people and beyond that there exists such a uh, tacit uh, um, influence within the news organization and other institution that the powerful are exerting their influences uh, in a very indirect and uh, subtle way. Thank you for listening. I can't say it won't be frog legs to nice dinner. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Um, we are running behind. We should so start in 10 minutes. The so you have 10 minutes for discussion. Oh, all right. So for the three, oh, for the speakers, oh. please return. We'll see if there are questions from the audience. So we have 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> and we'll see, if, uh, we'll see if you have questions for them. Oh, sorry, Martin, you, you had your hand first. I was very impressed by this photo from the last <laughs> it's your story, right? <laughs> Speak louder. But the earlier one. The earlier one was a woman looking upstream. And it's me. I've heard so many speeches, including my own. I feel like a salmon. Swimming upstream. You know how difficult it is for a salmon to swim upstream. I watched that when I was in Vancouver many years ago. And when the central government wants to exercise their comprehensive jurisdiction over our country, and if we want to resist that, aren't we all salmon trying to resist such pressure from above? And we've got to swim upstream to get to our goal. And that's very difficult. If you think what a communist would do when it is a communist group would do when they are in power. They want to control education, news, 
right? And of course, every branch of government, the police, of course, do. And when you when you're a policeman or reporter and so on, the, the orders will not come from Beijing. The orders will come from your, your superior and all the way up. And that's exactly what's happening. Do we trust the police anymore? I can tell my own experience. They arrested me twice, but they didn't prosecute me. <laughs> but they took a long time making sure that I was kept in the police station for as long as possible. <laughs> but they took my fingerprints. It was so slow. I said, look, don't you have, can I not put all my fingers there? <laughs> and you take them all? I'm sorry. We got only one such a machine. So they took every print, every print. And it took, of course, a long time. And it happened to me. I had no experience before. When I came out, I used to say, I used to say you mean in the whole of Hong Kong, there's only one machine that you can put all the fingerprints together? So, I, I can feel that the first round of tear gas were fired at me because I was telling the people mm -hmm. love and peace. Mm -hmm. Don't hate the policemen. They are just doing their job. So we are all here now. Sit down. Love and peace. And they fired tear gas at me. <laughs> so, you know, at the end of the day, I think I thank Ming Chen for doing all that. And it's incredible. You can fit everything into one day. <laughs> but when we go home, what do we do? I suggest don't give up. The one can be two system, we support it. And the only way for it to work two is when all the promises two systems. and trying to join declaration, and then now in the basic law, yeah. must be kept to the full. It will be a difficult fight for all of us. But let us swim upstream like all these salmons do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have another question on the floor. Yes. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask the last speaker. Uh, you know, your framework on constitutive censorship. I was wondering if we kind of turn the focus to something that's a bit closer to home, which is academic freedom in Hong Kong. <laughs> Uh, how applicable, if at all, would it be to uh, analyzing the state of academic freedom in Hong Kong? Thank you for asking. I, I am trying to argue that um, it is applicable to other institutions, like the university, the judiciary. For judiciary, I think, um, as Martin said, the influence came from the institution itself. And uh, in the past few years, um, the National People's Congress has developed a hierarchy that is through interpretation of basic law that the final call of, a, call of final appeal has to listen to the ruling of the MPC and it means building up a hierarchy that the lower court have to obey and then all the regulative power uh, can be exerted through this hierarchy. And for teachers, we always emphasize, and for police, we always emphasis on neutrality. Um, this is a problematic word. Also objectivity. When we talk about journalistic objectivity, what is it? Uh, many people will have different interpretation, but this uh, ambiguity is exactly um, the place where the senior management and the powerful people can uh, manipulate if they are powerful enough, if they, they, they have more cultural capital than the uh, frontline journalists. And this is uh, a place of contest. I mean, the neutrality. And I think this uh, discourse happens in many other professions. And for example, in social work, I met a social worker uh, after she listened to my presentation of the, uh, the new genre of programs. It basically means uh, the TV station nowadays, uh, 
it's a real situation. They now have 10 proposals of new programs and how to decide which one to produce. They will decide after they got sponsorship. That means it's no longer mission driven, it's money driven. And we are talking about news. So it's a paradigm shift to many of us. Uh, the soft program I talked about, I, I forgot to mention, why they want to produce so much. It was because they can gain a lot of advertisement and title sponsorship by these soft items. So I think, um, I hope I, I'm working on that uh, in the latest stage. I will try to uh, use this framework to other disciplines. If I may add a point, being an academic for one, the last 25 years before the handover, Hong Kong U, the most colonial corrupt university in some sense, <laughs> start the trend of not academic non-freedom, but managerialism. And then Lawrence Hall told me that at education university, who was elevated university status a couple of years ago, <laughs> now also practice how many forms for this and that. And of course, my good friend who was Sunday Low was only too happy to get out of that place to move back to a different place. Because using the term of information collection and also learning a lot of Bei Da Qinghua's categorization, if you probably in this journal, one point, this point, good luck. So this kind of non-academic interference in the political sense, the managerialism, administrative burden, is a meat grinder Then you spend 80% of your time teaching, 10% of time researching another 10% and you still have that left to manage the bureaucracy. Yeah. And then you don't have time to do protest. Sorry, mate. Time. Sorry, mate. We spend fifty percent managing the bureaucracy. Put away our chairman. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The latest innovation to add is that uh, they ask all of us right to fill in the time, time sheet, sheet, right? Time, time, time sheet, right? Time Which is, I guess, basically the most brutal form of control, right? Stalinization. Yeah. So don't blame Maoism. It yeah. is the software form of Leninism to extreme Stalinization, and if I may say, it would be wrong for people to criticize President Xi Jinping as remarkification. Actually, he and Mr. Putin are much more different. They are aiming at neo-Stalinization. Oh. May, may I add a few words in response to one of these questions? Uh, very, very, very quick. And, uh, Based on what I have researched and interact with those uh, police officers and the uh, parents, the demonstrators, I think uh, to a certain extent, they all are affected by a myth of neutrality and a myth of um, so-called ambiguity. I think to a certain extent, Hong Kong's success, social success in the past several decades was based on ambiguity. Because we do not like and we do not want and we deliberately do not uh, define or understand the real meaning of some of those keywords advocated by the top leaders. They said a lot, for example, let's see fair. What does it mean? And everybody actually have their own interpretations. Neutrality, I just mentioned some very, very basic understanding, but of course, this should be deviated from the academic understanding about, you know, uh, absence from party politics and the word means to work a particular political party. In the aspect of policing, I totally agree with Martin's word because police got totally legal foundation, total legal foundation to work on for every protest management tactics. But the point is, you get the legal foundation doesn't mean you can weep over the hearts of the Hong Kong people. Because a lot of parents, they are not the regular demonstrators. They just feel that 9 to 8, although you said you are totally legal, legally justified, but the point is, how come you use so unreasonably high level of force? Of course, from the police perspective, it is reasonable. You can compare with the other states, other society. But I, I think, try to conclude what I, I just presented and what I, I, the other speaker just mentioned. I think Hong Kong's success in the past 20 years may be initially built on the politics of ambiguity. And now, we have to awake. We have to make it clearer 
Maybe from the Beijing's perspective, we have to make it clearer as well. Problems arise. Now, in the essence of policing, it's the same because we have some kind of paradoxical emergent nation towards the police. And now, they face with the dilemma. Okay, uh, very good. So I think we would adjourn the session and uh, bring in the new... Uh, the Start next. immediately, the okay. closing round table. The, oops, we'll have a closing round table, and if you have any further questions, um, you can certainly raise them. Thank you so much. Is Larry Diamond here? Yes, Larry. Mm -hmm.